express once again that it's been a joy to worship with you not only in the morning, but also in the evening to bracket and bookend the day with the praises of Zion. Thank in particular the Gerges family for hosting me for part of the afternoon and for Ash for allowing me to tag along with him as he performed some duties necessary. And uh, thank you once again for warmly welcoming me into your midst. I'm very thankful for these times. Turn now to the ministry of the Word. We'll read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. Earlier we read from Ecclesiastes 3. It's a time, a season, purpose under heaven, and the preacher, King Solomon, listed several different pairs of timings for different contrasting things. We find something similar in Mark 2 with a new Solomon, the great king, our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll begin reading in verse 18 of Mark chapter 2. This is the word of the Lord. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Thus ends the reading, God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Amen. Amen. Let us pray as we approach our God. O Father, we come to you calling upon your name that you would be mighty to save that you would bless not only the reading, but the proclamation of this word. And we ask that you would grant us a perfect heart of wisdom to know when it is appropriate to fast and when it is appropriate to feast. We pray these things through our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There is a time and place for that, just not here and now. Some things are appropriate or fitting in one context, but not in another. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, you might wear hiking gear to the mountains, and that would be appropriate, but you probably wouldn't wear hiking gear to a formal dinner. Wouldn't make much sense. Uh, you might speak to your spouse about the family budget at a family meeting, but you probably would avoid that topic on a romantic date. Similarly, you might tell jokes around the campfire, but you wouldn't tell jokes at a funeral. It's bad form. It's not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with hiking gear or the budget or jokes, but it's a question of fittingness appropriateness. It's a question of wisdom. There's a time and a place for that, but perhaps not here and now. Well, it's this very issue that causes conflict in our text. If you're reading through the Gospel of Mark, this is the third of five waves of conflict that Jesus encounters with the scribes 
and the Pharisees. And each time it hinges on a question. First of all, there was the question of Jesus' authority to forgive sins, and that caused controversy. Then there was the question of his eating and drinking with sinners, and that caused controversy. Well, here it's the question of why John's disciples and those of the Pharisees fast, but Jesus' disciples don't. The question of fittingness, appropriateness, of wisdom. Thankfully, a greater than Solomon is here. King Jesus shows us the way of wisdom, and it's simply this, the heart of the text. There's a time to fast, and there's a time to feast. Time to fast, time to feast. Wisdom knows the difference. Or to put it in Solomon's words, to everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. We're going to look at this theme under three headings. First, the problem in verse 18. Then the parable in verses 19 to 20. And finally, the Proverbs in verses 21 to 22. Problem, parable, Proverbs. Let's begin with the problem. Let's read verse 18 together. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? The problem is one of fasting, or rather the absence of fasting. What is fasting? In our book of church order, it talks about a session calling a day of prayer and fasting. But what is it? Uh, Danny Hyde, a a URC minister, reform pastor, uh, has this helpful definition. Fasting is a religious abstaining from food for a set period of time in order to humble body and soul before God as a help in drawing near to him in prayer. It's the opposite of feasting. In feasting, you enjoy the meal. In fasting, you push the meal away. You abstain from food. And here, a group of people, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees, perhaps the scribes, see a problem. They note the discrepancy between the practice of John's disciples and that of Jesus' disciples. The one group fasts, the other doesn't. And this is a problem. Before we jump to Jesus' answer, however, it's helpful to ask the question, uh, why were these other two groups of people fasting, the disciples of John of the Pharisees? Well, first of all, this was simply the custom of the day. If you were a pious Jew living in Palestine in the first century, you would have fasted twice a week, on Monday and on Thursday. Uh, Luke 18, the Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. Um, But it wasn't just a custom. Uh, This tradition emerged from actual biblical data. If you look at the law, on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, the people were commanded to confess their sins, and part of that involved fasting. They afflicted themselves. We see this crop up in the history books where King David prays and fasts over the life of his son, his infant son who died. We see something similar where David and the children of Israel lament and mourn and fast over the death of King Saul and Jonathan. We see it in the book of Esther. We see it in the Psalms. We see it in the prophets. Uh, Jonah, chapter 3, the people of Nineveh repented of their sins in sackcloth, ashes, and fasting, similar to Daniel chapter 9. And if we look at all of these biblical examples, a certain pattern emerges, and that's that people fasted um, in these sorts of categories. First of all, it was commanded only once a year. The only command to fast was on the Day of Atonement. Uh, Later on, the Jews would uh, have requirements for fasting on four annual festivals in addition, but principally it was one time a year, the Day of Atonement. Other than that, fasting was voluntary. It could be public. The whole people 
could be private. But what usually happened is it involved at least one of the four following things. Sorrowing over sin, we could say confession. Uh, sorrow over um, suffering, we could say lamentation. Um, intense supplication or intercession, people crying out to God to avert disaster, obtain blessing. But in all of these, the, the crux of fasting, when coupled with prayer, is really this. Fasting means getting serious with God. Where you're not simply crying out to the Lord, but you're so intent, so blood earnest, that you're willing to push the food away for a set period of time, a day, a week, weeks. But regardless of the time frame, it means getting serious with God. And this, this biblical data comes to a sharp point in the preparatory ministry of John the Baptist. With John the Baptist, we see him calling upon people to repent of sin, to sorrow over sin. His disciples fasted. Here at this juncture of history, surely his disciples lamented the state of Israel, surrounded by the pagan powers. They were crying out to God to avert disaster of judgment. They were crying out to God for the restoration of blessing. They were preparing themselves, getting serious with God because they anticipated the coming of Messiah. So fasting, just putting this all together, is a custom. It was at points commanded in Scripture and revealed in Scripture, and it was fitting in this particular juncture of redemptive history as they were waiting for the coming of the Christ. And Jesus himself fasted for 40 days. Putting all of this together, you might wonder, why did his disciples not fast? What's wrong with Jesus' disciples? Well, here, Jesus answers, and he does so in the form of a parable. And that brings us to our second point, the parable. There's actually a move in Mark's gospel that begins here. Jesus has been declaring publicly that the kingdom of God is at hand. The time has come. The time is fulfilled. He's proclaiming the message of good news. But here, as he encounters more resistance, Jesus, as it were, begins to put the veil over his message. He begins to cloak his message in the form of parables. Later on in chapter 4, he has a whole list of parables. This is the beginning of that partial concealment of his message. And this parable, in particular in our text, has both a present and a future perspective. Look first at the present perspective of the parable in verse 19. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Here, in this parable, Jesus uses the metaphor of a wedding banquet, a marriage feast, similar to what we'll partake of at the end of the service. He says, literally, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? The sons of the wedding hall, are they able to fast at such a time? And of course, the answer is no. They cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. In other words, you don't fast at a wedding feast. If you go to someone's wedding at the reception and they bring out the cake and the fine foods and the wine and everyone is ecstatic, they're joyful, it's a celebration. And if in that context you were to bow your face with tears in your eyes, and push away the food, it would be totally jarring with the atmosphere. You don't fast at a wedding feast. It's simply not appropriate. In fact, in the Jewish context, uh, the time of feasting at a wedding would, might, might last as much as a week, and fasting would kill the joy 
of the moment. Jesus is saying, the bridegroom's here, the wedding feast is on, why are you fasting? Why aren't you feasting? In this parable, it's clear that Jesus himself is the bridegroom, and his friends are his disciples, his attendants, his guests, the sons of the wedding hall. And it's perhaps easy to overlook, but we actually learn something about Jesus in this parable. If you look in the Old Testament, the person consistently identified with the bridegroom is Jehovah, or Yahweh, while Israel is the bride. And here, Jesus takes upon himself the title of the bridegroom, who's come for his bride, his people. If we connect the dots, Jesus is saying that in his person, God is present. The divine bridegroom has finally come. People had waited long. Think of Anna in the temple, praying, fasting, crying out to God for years, longing for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, after all those years of silence, tears, pain, suffering, fasting, I've come. It's time to feast. There's also a second, second of all, a future perspective to this parable. That's the present perspective. But in verse 20, we see a future perspective. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Note the future perspective. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. We could actually translate it, then they will fast in that day. What is Jesus talking about? If he's the bridegroom, then when will he be taken away from his friends? We actually hear an echo of the prophet Isaiah in this text. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 53, that great servant song, in verse 8 of that chapter, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken, taken from prison and from judgment, taken away from them. This is actually the first explicit reference in Mark's gospel to the cross. Yes, it's veiled in language of a parable, but here in that language of the day is coming when the bridegroom will be taken away, we see, as it were, the cross from a distance. This is where Jesus is going. This is why he came. That this day is really the day of atonement. The day when the divine bridegroom shows himself to be the suffering servant. Jesus points to a day when the scribes and the Pharisees will take him away. Yes, he'll eat and he'll drink with his disciples on the eve of the Passover, on the Passover meal, on the eve of crucifixion. But then he'll be taken away from the garden to the court to the cross, condemned, scourged, crucified. Jesus points to a movement from wedding to funeral, from joy to sorrow, from feasting to fasting. Just as the friends of the bridegroom will mourn when he's taken away from them, even so his disciples will mourn when he is crucified. Then they will fast in that day, the great day of atonement. And for three days, his disciples prayed, wept, perhaps fasted, 
mourning the death of their king, mourning the death of the bridegroom as his friends. But of course, you know that by the mighty power of the Spirit, the Father raised up his son from the dead, and Jesus ate with them once again on the beach. They shared a breakfast meal, and then he was with them, and they were rejoicing. The bridegroom has returned from the dead. But of course, after 40 days, he ascended to his father. He sent the comforter, the helper, which is far better, but it's true that from that time, not only was Jesus taken away from his disciples at the cross, but our passage almost telescopes the cross to the ascension because since the ascension, where is Jesus? Well, he's bodily at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Yes, Jesus has come, but he's also been caught up to heaven and, as it were, taken away from us. And his disciples had occasion to mourn and to fast once again. Our text points to the fact that at this stage, they should be feasting. At the cross, they fast. And in this age, there is something of a tension. We feast because Jesus has already come, and we fast because he has not yet come. With this parable, Jesus solves the problem raised by his critics, but he briefly illustrates his point further by using two proverbs, and that brings us to our third and final point, from the problem to the parable to finally the proverbs. We talked about Solomon, who used many proverbs in the wisdom literature. Well, here Jesus uses two proverbial sayings, the first about new cloth and the second about new wine. Look at the new cloth proverb in verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. The idea is that if you have an old garment and it needs to be patched, you don't patch it with a piece of unshrunk or unbleached cloth. Because if you do, when you wash the garment, the patch will shrink, it will contract, while the rest of the clothing doesn't. And for those of you who are up on your laundry science of how this works, it will make the tear all the worse. It will rip. It will tear. He also has a proverb about new wine. Look at verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. In Jesus' day, they would have stored wine in bags of leather or skins. They called them wineskins. And if a wineskin was old, it was hard and brittle, but you put new wine into it, as the fermentation process happened, it would expand. But there was nowhere for the new wine to go, and so it would literally burst the wineskin. The wine would be spilled. It would be ruined. What do these Proverbs mean? What is Jesus talking about? Well, on the one hand, they build on the parable of the wedding feast. They show forth that principle of fittingness or appropriateness, that just as it's not appropriate to fast at a wedding feast, even so, it's not appropriate, fitting, or a good idea to patch an, an old cloth which, with a new patch. It's not appropriate, fitting, or a good idea to put new wine into old wineskins. But on the other hand, these proverbs have a deeper significance. Note the interplay in our passage between things old and things new. Old garment, new cloth. Old wineskins, new wine. As a scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is like the master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is old and what is new. This language points to a transition from the old covenant to a new covenant. 
from the old Israel to a new Israel, from an old creation to a new creation. You can't simply patch up the old with the new. It needs a total renovation. You can't try to contain the new with the old. It can't handle it. And here we find the, the cataclysmic nature of the inbreaking kingdom of God, that the old Israel with its scribes and its Pharisees, it cannot bear the disruptive power of the new, like an old garment with a new patch, it just tears. The old Israel with its scribes and its Pharisees cannot contain the expulsive power of the new, like old wineskins with new wine, they're burst asunder. This isn't just a question about the ethics of fasting. Jesus is proclaiming the good news of a new age, a new Israel, a new covenant, a new age is dawning, an age punctuated by joy, by feasting, by celebration, by power. Nothing else can compare with or contain what Jesus brings to the table. And that's why he continues to have conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes. They're part of that old order. They feel threatened, rightly so, by the coming of the new in Christ Jesus. And finally, they'll have no more of it. And so they take him away to the cross, crucify him, kill him, and they lay him in a tomb. The congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens when you put the new Israel into an old tomb? Well, it's the same thing that happens when you put a new patch on an old garment or you put new wine into old wineskins. On the third day, Jesus tore the bars away and he burst the empty tomb because the old creation cannot contain the power of resurrection. So how do we apply this text? Two basic applications. First, fast because the bridegroom has not yet returned. It's appropriate in this age, as pilgrims on this earth, it's appropriate for us to fast. In fact, Jesus elsewhere speaks of times when you fast, and the assumption is that you will. And he says this because it's appropriate in this present evil age, as we're surrounded by suffering, by pain, and by death, to mourn our sin, to mourn the loss of loved ones, to intercede with the Lord, to get serious with God. Tertullian, the North African church father, said this, that when we fast, we assail heaven and touch God's heart. There are a few things that are so simple, but so counter-cultural. Uh, Danny Hyde says, speaks of it this way, fasting in an age of fast food. The world will not get it. That this people, surrounded by modern conveniences, by fast food chains, is willing to say, in our privileged American context, I, for a set period of time, whether it's a day or a week or whatever, am going to devote myself to prayer and to fasting, because I want to get serious with God. It might be corporately as a people, it might be individually, but this is a way that shouts our distinctiveness in Christ Jesus. Fasting not to earn God's favor, 
but by his grace to get serious with him. That's the first application. It's appropriate. When something bad happens to you, it's not helpful for someone necessarily to come up and try to simply cheer you up. No. We weep with those who weep. We sit and listen with those who've suffered tragedy. We mourn. We lament. We, as it were, sing the blues with the psalmists in those great psalms of lamentation and mourning. It's appropriate to do that in this age. And fasting is a tangible reminder of the reality of mourning. There's a second application, and that is to feast, because Jesus has not only already come, but he's coming again. And tonight, as we come to the Lord's table, we have a reminder that though we occasionally fast and we mourn and we confess our sins, we also come to the table of a Lord who has come for us and for our salvation, and we proclaim his death till he comes. At this supper, we get a foretaste of the return of the king, the return of the bridegroom, who comes with joy, with healing in his wings. At this table, by the power of the Spirit, we lift up our hearts to heaven until we drink wine with him in the kingdom of God. There's a time to fast. There's a time to feast. And wisdom is knowing the difference. Today, as we come to the table, we are reminded that this time is a time to feast. And even as Aaron did, Aaron was commanded at the death of his sons not to shed a tear because in that moment he was in the temple. He was arrayed in his priestly garments and he was a picture of joy and celebration. And God said, do not cry because it wasn't fitting at that time. Even so, this is a time to rejoice as we long for that day when Jesus comes again. To know wisdom is to know when to fast and when to feast. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we do mourn our sins and we sorrow over the miseries of this life. And yet, O oh Lord, in the same breath, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. For you have sent your Son for us to purchase us with his blood, and we have confident expectation that he will come again. And with that truth ringing in our ears and treasured up in our hearts, we do rejoice, and indeed we shall rejoice. We feast. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In response to God's